My name is Matthew Amar, I'm the MC, but I'd like to invite uh, the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic of um, your host institution, Victoria University of Wellington, to Hiranga Waka, uh, Professor Robin Longhurst, to the podium to give you, to offer you some welcome remarks. Professor Longhurst. Uh, welcome to Te Hiranga Waka, Victoria University of Wellington. My warmest greetings to you all, including our many, many dignitaries who we're honoured to have here with us uh, this afternoon. These include New Zealand's Minister for Trade, the Honourable Todd McClay, who will be arriving shortly. The Ambassador of Peru to New Zealand, His Excellency Jose Bustinza. The Ambassadors of Argentina, Brazil, Cuba, Canada, the European Union de Delegation, Switzerland, Papua New Guinea, the United Arab Emirates and Egypt. The Charte d'Affaires of Chile and Mexico. Other members of the Diplomatic Corps, and representatives of APEC economies. New Zealand's former Trade and Climate Change Minister and Ambassador to the United States in WTO, the Honourable Tim Grosser. MFAT Deputy Secretary, Vangelis Vitalis. The Mayor of Palmerston North and former Mayor of Wellington. Former APEC Director, Executive Director, Dr. Alan Bollard and other panellists and the Director of the Southeast Asia Cape and other Cape colleagues. So, as Matthew said, my name is Robin Longhurst and I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Vice here at uh, Te Hiranga Waka, Victoria University of Wellington. I've been in this role for a grand total of three weeks, so a very warm welcome to you all. We are absolutely delighted that the event this evening is being held at Victoria University. As the university is an important venue where really diverse communities can come together to share knowledge and perspectives on key themes facing our society. We're proud to have been hosting the Latin America and Southeast Asia Cape, and if any of you in the room don't know, Cape stands for Centre of Asia Pacific Excellence. And we've been hosting this since 2017. And indeed, there have been many creative outcomes resulting from this CAPE. And one that I'll just mention uh, briefly this afternoon is the virtual Machu Picchu project. So school students get the chance to, to visit Peru and learn about its people and culture thanks to an experiential learning tool developed by Associate Professor Christian Schott from our own Wellington School of Business and Government. On a personal note, I was very fortunate in my early 20s to visit the real Machu Picchu. Also the real Lima and Cusco and Arequipa, the Nazca Lines. As a young adult, these experiences in Peru were absolutely formative, something I've treasured throughout my life. So it gives me special pleasure to be here this evening. So again, a very warm welcome to everyone, and I'm now going to hand you over to the wonderful director of the Latin America Cape, Dr. Matthew Omar. Thank you, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, uh, for those kind words of introduction. Uh, I'm your event MC tonight. We've got a packed program, so I'll keep things moving along quite quickly, but may I first join uh, Professor Longhurst in welcoming the Minister shortly, ambassadors, and everyone who's joined us on this, uh, for this evening. Uh, in case you don't know the Capes and the Latin America Cape, our centre was created to prepare New Zealanders to engage and do business with Latin America. To do so, we've developed a range of initiatives and resources, one of the most very recent is a tool called Wayfinding. Check it out if you can, we're very proud of it. A data visualisation tool. It shows the connections between New Zealand and Latin America 
And if you go into it, you'll see that they cover business, education, diplomacy, student exchange, and a whole lot of other things. As you can see from this arrow, there's actually more relationships between New Zealand and Latin America than is often realised. But events as well as tools, and what events like this one do, is um, elevate conversations about Latin America and our nation. They show the importance of entities of Latin America for our region's connection, New Zealand's connection, to wider regional interests such as APEC. They also foster a critical mass of engagement with our region. They actually bring together people across very different parts of our society. And tonight, for example, we have VIPs, and thank you for coming, but we also have business people, academics, students, and officials from several government agencies and NGOs and private sector groups. And we hope that all of you will be able to stay on after the formal proceedings to share perspectives from each other and learn from each other. But I need to explain before we get on to the drinks, let's have an, let's have an event first. Uh, and so the event tonight is basically trying to achieve three goals. And each goal has a part of the program. We're going to introduce you to, or remind you of, the importance of APEC for New Zealand, for Aotearoa, for our own community. Then, because it's Peru's APEC year, we're going to focus on Peru's goals for APEC. And lastly, we'll hear our Trade Minister's insights on New Zealand's goals for APEC this year. So as I said, each of these goals will have a different part of the event. And to set the scene for what's to come, however, I thought I'd just like you to play a beautiful video that the host nation has prepared for this year's APEC. Somos el nevado que se convierte en vida. Somos el río que recorre la selva eterna. Megadiversa, infinita. Somos el mar que nos regala sus secretos. Somos milenios y milenios de historia. Somos tradición que perdura. Somos la chispa, la creatividad que nunca se apaga. Somos las manos que crean, transforman y construyen. Somos la fuerza que emprende, que sale adelante. Siempre. Somos el plato amable servido en la mesa. Somos la melodía irresistible que te invita a bailar. Somos la cálida sonrisa que te da la bienvenida. Somos sol, somos tierra, somos mar. Y este año somos APEC Perú 2024, el punto de encuentro para reimaginar el comercio en la región Asia-Pacífico, donde sumamos esfuerzos para tener un comercio más libre, accesible e inclusivo. Este es el momento decisivo para adoptar un crecimiento sostenible, el momento de consolidar el tránsito a energías limpias y a una economía circular, el momento de afinar la ruta de nuestra seguridad alimentaria, el punto de quiebre para transitar a una economía global, formal e inclusiva, donde la transformación digital reduce brechas, donde la inclusión financiera empodera a las mujeres, donde las herramientas innovadoras impulsan en el desarrollo del turismo. Durante este 2024 tendremos oportunidades para dialogar y reflexionar sobre el presente y futuro para la prosperidad de nuestras poblaciones y así tomar decisiones que beneficien a emprendedores, a las pequeñas y medianas empresas, a nuestros ciudadanos. Alin Hamuku y Kaichum, Kametsa Pimpok, Walip Hutaptaja. Bienvenidos a Perú. Bienvenidos a la oportunidad de trabajar juntos por una región Asia-Pacífico próspera y sostenible.
There is a place where the Pacific Ocean embraces a territory with a millinery history, cradle of one of the oldest civilizations to inhabit our planet. A country that bet on integrating with the world to create opportunities for its people, with endless possibilities for trade and investment. Adding to its cultural diversity, vast geographical wealth, and exceptional cuisine, offering an ideal scenario to generate synergies between our economies and together drive the success of the Asia-Pacific region. As one of the soundest economies in Latin America, today Peru looks forward with optimism to a future where businesses and people work for prosperity in our region. Let us together continue building the most innovative, sustainable and inclusive cooperation forum on the planet. Welcome to the APEC CEO Summit Peru 2024. People, business, prosperity. Well, there's, that's a beautiful video and there's a lot to unpack there and we're going to talk about it all tonight. And the first thing, however, that we need, I'd like to do is, as I said, talk about the implications of APEC for this country. And so I'd like to now invite our panellists to come up to these chairs here. Um, as they're coming up, I'll introduce them to you. We have um, Dr. Alan Bollard, the former Executive Director of the APEC Secretariat and um, uh, Chair of PEC in New Zealand. We have Stephen Jacoby, Ex Executive Director of the New Zealand International Business Forum and the APEC Business Advisory Council. We have Shiloh Babington, Global Research Alliance Lead, Indigenous Research Network and Ministry for Primary Industries. And Shisla McLeod, APEC Voices alumna and New Zealand Customs Service. So I'll join the panellists now. We actually... These will come on shortly. While, 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 they, while they power up, um, just so you know, we've got about 15 minutes, not 20 for this panel panellists, so I'll ask them all an individual question. Uh, we're now live and then we'll have a bit of fluidity and we'll save our questions for the end, if that's okay. So you've got a, if you've got a really interesting question to ask the panellists, please do so at the end and um, so we can keep going with the proceedings. So um, I'll start, I'll really go left, my left to right, um, your, your right, your left to right too. There you go. <laughs> no, you're right. Well, anyway, let's move on. Um, um, Alan, the panel, as I said, is to talk about the importance of APEC to New Zealanders. And you had a really privileged insight into that. You were the executive director, the first two-time executive director of, of APEC in, in its Singapore office from 2011 to 2012 to 2018. From your experience, what do you think have been APEC's main contributions to New Zealand's place in the Asia-Pacific region since its formation 25 years ago. Now, I know you can give a lecture on it. You've got two minutes. Okay, all right. Oh, thank you, Matthew. I'm not the first person to two-time APEC, if it comes down to that. But um, the simple answer is APEC has helped build the environment that New Zealand needs to trade into originally and more recently a whole range of capital and people movements across the Pacific that's really important. The more difficult one way of answering that is the question that was posed in 2016 in Lima at the Leaders Summit for APEC after a year in which we'd had Brexit, some weird stuff going on in Eastern Europe and then the American election. And we had a whole bunch of leaders standing around saying what just happened? And of course they say it more politely, and then turning to me and one or two others in the room and saying, why can't you economists explain the advantages of APEC to people in the world? And of course the answer we all know has always been that it's very difficult to show the very specific gains from um, trade compared to some of the, the quite specific losses there. 
But we're talking about a region where APEC has, since the Cold War, been the, one of the many reasons why trade has grown in the region for all of us, and something like a billion people have come out of poverty into middle class. That's a billion people. That's more than ever happened in the world or will ever happen again, and we've been able to take advantage of a lot of that as well. Delighted to see that, um, that uh, Lima and Peru are hosting again, and um, they'll move APEC forward the way it needs to go. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, Stephen, a few years ago, a few years after its creation, the APEC uh, economy leaders created ABAC, the APEC Business Advisory Council, um, to draw on the private sector so that they could inform the um, deliberations of the leaders. So you've been the executive director of ABAC in New Zealand for several years, and as such, you've been part of many dialogues between government and business. What would you say have been the primary outcomes of those discussions for New Zealand businesses and for the wider prosperity of our nation? Well, thank you, Matthew. Kia ora, tātou e te whānau. Muy buenas tardes a todos e todas. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you and to be talking about uh, APEC, particularly in the year of Peru. Uh, ABAC, the APEC Business Advisory Council, is really a rather unique organisation because we are business people, but we are mandated by the APEC economic leaders, all 21 of them, to give our advice on APEC's agenda for sustainable and inclusive growth in our region. And we do that directly to the leaders, uh, both through a report through letters to ministers, but also very importantly, uh, in a dialogue that takes place at the end of each year. This year it will take place obviously in Lima, in, Lima in, in November. And we sit with those leaders and talk to them about that agenda. It's a very powerful way of magnifying the business voice. And I think I can say to you in all honesty that everything that ABAC has written and said about trade liberalisation in the last 15, or I see my colleague Brian Lynch there, even longer than that, uh, everything we have said as an organisation has either been crafted or curated by New Zealand. Doesn't mean we always get to say exactly what we want, but we play an important role in building the consensus within ABAC for those recommendations to go to the leaders, and that's important in APEC, which as you know is a voluntary and non-binding um, organisation. And I think it's fair to say that we have been successful in holding APEC to its foundational principles about the importance of the free movement of goods, services and capital. Vangelis Vitalis, who's just joined us, will really like that. Uh, we've kept them honest, but also about the critical importance of economic cooperation and capability in the region. So when it comes to um, the free trade area of the Asia Pacific, the greatest idea that's never yet been quite uh, realised, but we've made important strides towards it through TPP and other trade agreements. We have been there at advocating for that inside APEC. When it comes to supply chain connectivity and resilience, that's been on our agenda. Business principles for climate change, exclusion, uh, not exclusion, but inclusion of um, of uh, indigenous people and women uh, in uh, trade and investment in our region. Uh, the roadmap for the digital economy going forward, these are all things that are critical for New Zealand's business community that we've been able to take and socialise and have impact on uh, at the regional level. Thank you, Stephen. Just a couple of points to pick up on what you said in inclusion. Um, our next question will refer to that. Uh, people coming into the room, welcome those who have just joined us, uh, especially the Minister. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. Um, my next question is to Shiloh, um, Shiloh Babington. Um, over the years, APEC leaders have occasionally been uh, criticised for being disconnected from society, or at least seen as such. They would refute that, and indeed real efforts have been made to include traditionally underrepresented voices from across the Asia Pacific in APEC discussions. Now you were asked to be one of those voices last year in APEC's meeting in the United States. Um, can you just share us how you came to be part of that event? A little of what you said, and importantly, how your, mark, your remarks were received. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'll try and make this quick, um, but 
A little context, I lead the Global Research Alliance's Indigenous Research Network, co-led by New Zealand and Samoa. And this network aims to strengthen Indigenous voices in global agricultural issues and empower traditional knowledge and practices to be used in our fight against climate change. Um, while quite newly established, I've helped this network gain 37 member economies, and many of these members have joined from my um, experiences in APEC. Uh, it all started in February last year when I was invited to be a keynote speaker for an APEC workshop uh, focused on minority groups' efforts to reduce greenhouse gases. One thing I noticed was that in a panel focused on Indigenous groups and minorities, I was the only minority or Indigenous person represented. So, <laughs> um, But the United States government emailed me personally inviting me to be a keynote speaker once again at an APEC workshop. And um, they had offered to pay for all of my travel to get me to Seattle and I took this opportunity to hold people accountable for the barriers that we face as Indigenous peoples. And I'll quote my speech. As an Indigenous person, I am inclined to act behind the scenes without recognition or support while facing inequalities and discrimination. As a woman, I am inclined to act behind the scenes without recognition or support while facing inequalities and discrimination. As a young person, I am inclined to follow in the steps of the people around me. This cycle is a continuous loop because our voices haven't been heard. This is why, as a young Indigenous woman, I took this opportunity and urged people to increase access to resources for Indigenous women because this would create more sustainable and resilient communities. I made my speech not just about women, but also about youth. A global priority at the moment is sustaining our environment for future generations. So why aren't young people at the table for these conversations and actions to protect their own future? This is why when I got home from Seattle, I created an APEC workshop called Indigenous Research Network, The Power of Inclusivity, focused on gathering young Indigenous people as leaders of their community to display on a global stage the value of inclusion in climate decisions and actions. I had my first workshop in November last year, and because of its success, now I have my Peru, the Peru government has dedicated an entire day, the 14th of August 2024, to my in-person workshop in Peru. And this workshop series is co-sponsored by the United States, Australia, Peru and Canada. So APEC has been a huge step in starting my career and I assume it will carry on to be. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Chilo. Now, Schisler, one of Apex virtues for our centre, of course, a Latin America centre, is that it connects the western and eastern rims of the Pacific. Now, you have Latin American ancestry yourself, admittedly not Pacific Coast, your Brazilian ancestry, but you are also one of New Zealand's delegates in 2021 to the Apex Voices meeting that year. Now, it'd be great if you could share with the people here tonight a little bit about what Apex Voices is, but also how you engaged with the delegates there in trans-Pacific ways, how Kiwis and other people from Oceania spoke to people from the Americas and Asia. So, comments would be welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, kia ora koutou, ola todos. Um, lovely to see you all here. So, as Matthew said, I am Shizla, so I was very fortunate to be part of APEC Voices in 2020 um, and in 2021. Um, 2020 didn't go very well. <laughs> that was the year that the pandemic started, so I think we were kind of playing catch up with all of that. Um, but Voices of the Future is basically a platform um, for future leaders, uh, young leaders of the Asia Pacific to um, discuss with one another and express their concerns um, 
and hopes for the future of the APIC region. Um, it's a really great opportunity. And I was part of 2021, which was really interesting, um, doing it in person. Usually um, you'd fly to the host economy and hold those conversations in person. Uh, we didn't have that privilege, although actually it was New Zealand, so I was here already. <laughs> um, but it was, it was also a really, really good time because I think for one of the first times in my generation anyway, we had all these problems that weren't um, local problems or domestic problems, they were actually global challenges. And so the discussions were very much focused on um, those issues and we had very similar ways of um, thinking about those and combating those. Um, and we engaged in very creative ways. Uh, we weren't able to go out for dinners and do activities, etc. But we did um, really value those interactions. We were all in some form of lockdown, um, so we got creative and would share the book that we were reading at the moment, and also being really compassionate with one another. Um, we were all reading the news and seeing what was happening around the world. Um, so although we couldn't be there in person, I think it was still a really good year um, to be part of the APIC Voices. Um, and I think the APIC Voices is very important for um, two main reasons, actually. I think we all know that um, international engagement is extremely important for New Zealand. Um, and as future leaders of New Zealand, um, it's important to prepare us um, for those international engagements. I, now working at New Zealand Customs, a pick is one of my portfolios. <laughs> so I think having that opportunity really, um, really prepared me for what's to come. Um, and I think that's, that's really important for us, but also it brings um, New Zealand to the forefront of the discussions and to the minds of future leaders of other economies as well. Um, the way that we engage as youth is important in shaping those perceptions that people have about our economy. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Now, I just wonder if any of the panellists have any comments to make on each other's presentations. Has there been any point that you've heard that you want to pick up on? So I'll, I'll throw, that, throw that open to any of you. I might just make one comment, and that is that APEC is often perceived, and, you know, um, with some justification, of being primarily about business and trade and investment, all the things I talked about just a moment ago. But I think, as we've heard, it actually has a much broader remit than this. Uh, the inclusion agenda in particular, the environmental agenda, uh, there are, there, it's a very wide sweep of things. Uh, and it's good that New Zealand you know, plays in all of those, um, in all of those areas. I'll just add that it seems like I'll be collecting lots of business cards tonight. <laughs> yeah, certainly, I mean, what I heard from the, the four of you speaking there was that there are dialogues. It's obviously dialogues among the leaders, the economies, but also business and groups that are seen as needing to be brought into the conversation or whose voices need to be heard to inform those um, to inform the insights every November. It's not just about dressing up in, in the apex suits at the end of the year, far, far from it. Um, a final word from any of you before we move on to the next part of our proceedings. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. Um, it, it's also important that we understand that these trade relationships are changing, that APEC is changing, that the focus is changing. It has to change. We're in real trouble if we don't. We're in that quite difficult world at the minute with US, China and other trade tensions bubbling all around. And we're in danger of getting trampled in some of that. So APEC suddenly has become much harder than when I was there because there isn't normal agreement around the table now from, the bigger, from some of the bigger players but much more important as well to keep that going. We need it. Thank you very much, Alan. Well, I, it's a very short panel, but we've got a packed program. The minister has come during his dinner break, so this is why we're moving so, so, so quickly. So um, if, you, if you'll join me in thanking the panel for their <laughs> remarks, and we'll move on to...
Well, now here, because this event is on APEC Peru, the Peruvian perspective. Now, we don't have our speakers in person tonight, but we've got three uh, senior leaders of the uh, Peruvian APEC year who will be talking to us. So our first up will be Ambassador Carlos Vasquez, who's the chair of APEC SOM. Now, SOM, there's lots of acronyms, um, senior officials meeting. So without further ado, I will actually introduce his remarks. Minister for Trade of New Zealand, Mr. Todd McClay, Dr. Matthew O'Meager, Director of Latin America Center for Asia-Pacific Excellence, Victoria University of Wellington, Ambassador Jose Bustinza, distinguished guests. Firstly, I would like to express my deep appreciation to the Center for Asia-Pacific Excellence of the Victoria University of Wellington and the Embassy of Peru in New Zealand for having organized this event. I would have loved to experience firsthand the charm and vibrancy of Wellington. However, thanks to the advancements of technology, I am grateful for the opportunity to be virtually present among you today. Though separated by our great Pacific Ocean, our shared commitment to advancing the goals of APEC unites us in purpose and vision today, particularly for New Zealand and Peru that are linked by a strong partnership recently reinforced thanks to the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP. New Zealand, being one of the architects of the CPTPP, along with Chile, Singapore and Brunei, played a crucial role in initiating what was then known as the P4 Agreement, which later evolved into the CPTPP. This agreement serves as a cornerstone for the FTAAP, laying the groundwork for broader economic integration across the Asia-Pacific region. Moreover, our partnership is set to deepen with the future accession of Peru to the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, further enhancing cooperation in the digital realm and fostering inclusive and sustainable growth for both our nations. <clears throat> On this occasion, I am particularly pleased to share with you the vision and priorities that Peru is leading in APEC 2024 for the benefit of the Asia-Pacific region. Under the theme Empower, Include, Grow, and with three key priorities in mind, Peru has embarked on a mission to deliver tangible outcomes that will shape the economic landscape of the Asia-Pacific region. These priorities are aimed at fostering inclusive growth, promoting innovation and digitalization for the transition to formal and global economy, and ensuring sustainable growth for resilient development. First and foremost, Peru is committed to advancing a new vision of the Free Trade Area of the Asia-Pacific, FTAAP, conceived over two decades ago by the APEC Business Advisory Council. Considering current global challenges and uncertainties surrounding trade, it is imperative to reaffirm our commitment to open, fair and transparent trade with a new look of F A FTAAP. Peru, as the host economy of APEC 2024, is taking the lead in facilitating dialogue among APEC member economies to revitalize discussions on the FTAAP. Through these dialogues, we aim to address emerging issues faced by our economies and explore new avenues for deeper economic integration. Furthermore, Peru is pioneering efforts to empower women as key economic actors through joint ministerial declarations on trade and women. This groundbreaking initiative which will bring together trade and women's ministers for the first time in APEX history, underscores Peru's commitment to gender equality and inclusive economic growth. Innovation and digitalization are also at the forefront of Peru's agenda. With a roadmap to promote the transition to formal and global economy, Peru is laying the groundwork for sustainable economic development in the digital age. An expert from New Zealand, Mr. Rory McLeod, said during the first Zoom meeting here in Lima some weeks ago, that informality was the missing link of APEC's inclusion agenda. By harnessing the power of digitalization, <clears throat> we aim to foster formal entrepreneurship to enhance productivity, mainly for small and medium enterprises, facilitating their integration into global value chains. Lastly, Peru is championing sustainable development through initiatives to combat food loss and waste and promote hydrogen for a low carbon energy transition. By addressing Pressing environmental challenges, such as food insecurity and climate change, Peru is paving the way for a resilient and sustainable future. Because of all of this, APEC Peru 2024 represents a unique opportunity to shape the future of the Asia-Pacific region. 
Through reinforced collaboration, we can overcome shared challenges and build a more prosperous and sustainable future for generations to come. I hope we will have an opportunity to meet in person soon during Apex events that are yet to come in the Peruvian towns of Lima, Arequipa, Trujillo, Cusco or Pucallpa. Best wishes to you all from across the Pacific. I should note that these videos were presented to us with the support and the collaboration and the great assistance of our friends in the Peruvian Embassy. So thank you very much, Ambassador, to you and your team and for everyone back in Lima for arranging these, these videos. Just like our second panellist, Stephen, spoke about ABAC and gave the business lens on uh, the New Zealand broad agenda for APEC historically, our second speaker will talk about the uh, business perspective from the Peruvian side. From ABAC Peru, we have the uh, chair of ABAC Peru, uh, Mrs. Senora Julia Torreblanca. Good evening with everyone. Esteemed Honorable Todd McClay, Minister of Trade of New Zealand, Dr. Alan Bollard, Ambassador Jose Pustinza, distinguished guests and participants. It is my pleasure to speak before you today at this APEC Peru 2024 gallery. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the Center of Asia Pacific Excellence for hosting this event and also to our Peruvian Embassy for their ongoing efforts to promote Peru and APEC 2024 in New Zealand. For Peru, APEC stands as a crucial mechanism for regional economic integration. Since joining in 1998, Peru has experienced substantial growth and economic development, opening its doors to the world's most dynamic region, including, of course, economies like New Zealand through the CPTPP. While this regional agreement sets the stage and the tone for our trade relations, I believe there are still untapped opportunities to strengthen our bilateral ties and business relations even further, and will strive to seize them. The private sector in Peru eagerly anticipates the visit of APEC ministers and leaders as it represents opportunities to foster development, expand markets and create new opportunities for Peru within the region. We are also thrilled about the upcoming APEC CEO Summit taking place in Lima in November as the premier business event in the Asia-Pacific region. It will gather CEOs, opinion leaders and senior political figures from around the world. Together, they'll engage in discussions on innovative ideas and solutions to address the region's most pressing challenges. Speaking of these pressing challenges, we are navigating a complex landscape marked by economic fragmentation, uncertainty, a pressing cost of living crisis, geopolitical turmoil, food security concerns and the increasing frequency of extreme weather events fueled by the climate crisis. APEC holds a unique position as a platform that brings together diverse economies and can play a pivotal role in addressing these urgent issues. It is within this context that Peru has the honor of hosting APEC this year, and I'm privileged to chair the APEC Business Advisory Council, or AVAC. Our approach prioritizes a people-centered strategy at the most aiming not only to provide recommendations to ministers and leaders, but also to deliver concrete and tangible outcomes that directly benefit individuals and businesses. AVAC's vision for 2024 is to promote regional economic integration, sustainability and human development by leveraging powerful catalysts such as digitalization and innovation alongside with finance and investment. In line with this vision, our theme for 2024 is People, Business, Prosperity. PBP, People, Business, Prosperity. Businesses are the main drivers of economic growth and development through their ability to innovate, invest, create jobs and expand markets. As a consequence, they play a key role in advancing prosperity for individuals and society. I will not be alone in these endeavors, thank goodness. I have the privilege of leading AVAC alongside with 
co-chairs Dominic Ng and Hugh Ng Lee, past and future ABAC chairs. Furthermore, we have exceptional business leaders serving as chairs of ABAC's working groups and guiding the development of our recommendations. The Regional Economic Integration Working Group is chaired by Rachel Taule Lee from ABAC New Zealand. She will guide the work and the priorities regarding the Free Trade Agreement and the Asia Pacific, Digital Trade and a New Services Agenda, Investment facil Facilitation, and Tax Systems in the Digital Economy Era. We also have a Sustainable Working Group, which is chaired by Frank Ning from ABAC China, leading the priorities on food security, circular economy, energy transition, and natural disaster risk preparedness. For 2024, we are channeling our inclusion discussions towards a new working group, Human Development, chaired by Tom Harley from AVAC Australia. Our priority in this area involves strengthening pension and healthcare systems, promoting digital transformation for human and skills development, and advancing financial inclusion. In addition to these working groups, we have two very important task forces. The Digital and Innovation Task Force, led by Janet De Silva from Eva Canada, and the Finance and Investment Task Force, led by Hiroshi Nakaso from Eva Japan. These task forces will oversee all cross-cutting themes in the working groups, ensuring alignment and synergies with the specific priorities. So, these are the goals and priorities that EVA has for 2024, which EVA Peru will continue to advocate for beyond this year. I wish I were with you all in New Zealand, but I hope to see you all here in Lima, Peru. Thank you very much. Our final speaker is representing uh, Peru's new trade minister. Good afternoon, Mr. Todd McLean. New Zealand's Minister for Trade, Ambassador Carlos Vasquez, APEC Peru 2024 Song Chair, Mrs. Julia Torreblanca, APEC 2024 Chair, fellow attendees. It is a pleasure to attend this important event virtually to share with you Peru's goals for APEC 2024. This 2024, Peru is the host for the third time of the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum. Under the theme, Empower, Include, Grow, Peru's three priorities are trade and investment for inclusive and interconnected growth, innovation and digitalization to promote transition to the formal and global economy, sustainable growth for resilient development. The Ministry of Foreign Trade and Tourism is leading the first priority, trade and investment for inclusive and interconnected growth. It encompasses three sub-priorities, trade liberalization, trade facilitation, and trade and inclusion. Minister is playing an active role in promoting these sub-priorities at the Committee on Trade and Investment, CTI, and its 10 working groups. First, on trade liberalization, we will work with economists to update the free trade area of the Asia-Pacific, the FTAAP. Our goal is to have a leader's document on a new look at the FTAAP. Secondly, on trade facilitation, Peru leads the agenda by promoting the strengthening of connectivity and transparency in supply chains, which will promote efficiency in trade transactions and facilitate a seamless connectivity for the economic competitiveness of the region. On trade and inclusion, this coming May in Arequipa, we will hold the first ever joint meeting of ministers of women and ministers of trade to discuss economic empowerment of women through trade. We look forward to having as one of our main deliverables for this year, the APEC joint ministerial statement on trade and women. Minsetul is also planning to have a dialogue on how trade can contribute to the transition of economic agents from the informal to the formal economy. Peru's long-term objectives are, first, to continuously strengthen our economic, financial, and trade relations with the Asia-Pacific. Right now, we have 22 bilateral and plurilateral agreements, including our membership in the CPTPP. This allows us 
to have preferential trade relations with 14 APEC economies, including New Zealand. Peru's trade with APEC members has grown at 9.5% annually from 1998 to 2023. Last year, our exports to APEC economies reached 44,089 million, while our imports totally 31,459 million. In 2023, our trade with New Zealand reached 93 million. We exported goods valued at 21 million, while our imports from New Zealand amounted 71 million. There are plenty, plenty opportunities for new businesses. Second, Peru's long-term goals in APEC is to become the hub for the trade in goods and services between South America and East Asia and Oceania. Gradually, the necessary infrastructure and logistics are being built. Allow me to illustrate with two examples. We are currently working on the initiative for the integration of regional infrastructure of South America, IRSA, which connects Peru with other countries in South America and will allow us to transport goods from these countries to our main ports. One of them is the Chancay port, expected to begin operation this November. The initiative for the integration of regional infrastructure in South America, IRSA, is a multilateral effort to link South America's economies through new transportation, energy, and telecommunications projects. IRSA investments are expected to integrate highway networks, riverways, hydroelectric dams, and telecommunication links through the continent. IRSA has projected 10 integration and development axes. Peru participates in three of these axes. One northern axis, Bayobar Port, Paita Port, Iquitos, Amazon River. Center axis, Callao Port, Pucalpa Port, Pucaliali River, Amazon River in Brazil, and Southern Axis, San Juan de Marcona Port, Matarani Port, Hilo Port, Maldonado Port, in Yapari, Brazil. In this map, we can see how these axes connect Peru to Brazil. The Chancay Port is located 67 kilometers north of our capital, Lima. It will have the capacity to mobilize 1 million of TEUs per year when its first stage begins operations. And it's expected to carry each year about 50% of the nearly 580 billion in trade between China and South America. The port is projected to become a regional hub and a South American maritime node to Asia and Oceania. The Port of Chancay will contribute to improve connectivity by providing shorter times, greater efficiency, and better competitive conditions for users, boosting trade and generating new businesses, business opportunities. As I previously stated, the first stage of the megaport is scheduled to begin operation in November this year, 2024. Thank you for your attention. Thank you to all the speakers. As you see, Peru's uh, ambitions for APEC are, are deep, profound, and its commitment to the Asia-Pacific and the economies of the Asia-Pacific is also extensive and genuine. And speaking of extensive and genuine commitments, it's now my honour to introduce our keynote speaker for tonight, uh, Trade Minister Todd McClay. Uh, as well as the Minister of of trade. He's the Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, Hunting and Fishing, and Associate Minister of Foreign Affairs. He has been the MP for Rotorua since 2008. He held several ministerial roles in the previous, in the fifth national government, rather, um, and he has previously been a diplomat himself, and therefore privy to the sort of discussions that the people in this room and the people you've just been listening to um, engage in. Personally, too, I think he played a huge role in keeping what eventually became the CPTPP alive. So I'd like to, to thank him for that. Minister, thank you for your patience. The floor is yours.
Well, Matthew, thank you so much, and good evening, everybody. Buenos Aires. It's a real uh, privilege to uh, be here. Can I start by thanking the Latin America Center for Asia Pacific Excellence for organizing this event and for inviting me to speak tonight? Uh, can I say I'm very excited at Peru hosting of uh, APEC uh, and very much look forward to uh, talking more about that uh, and sharing in uh, excellent cuisine. And uh, there's a debate that goes on amongst the Latin American countries here, Chile and Peru, as to whose pisco sour is better. <laughs> I think we should all sample and decide for ourselves. <laughs> now, I'd like to first acknowledge our distinguished guests, including Ambassador Bostinza of Peru and other members of the diplomatic corps, APEC uh, economies, business communities, and ladies and gentlemen. Can I also recognize uh, both Alan and Stephen, and thank you for your uh, words, Alan. Your uh, knowledge of APEC uh, is greater than anybody else I know, and of course, you've been so very committed to that uh, cause. And uh, Stephen, if there is anything you need to know about trade, he will know, and anything others have forgotten, he will also know. Uh, he uh, is there. Uh, Shiloh, I was quite inspired by what you had to say, uh, and uh, just recognise and congratulate you on that, and just only to say keep up the great, great work. I think it's not only important, but it's great for New Zealand to have uh, people like you uh, speaking up. And Shisla, you too, uh, it was fascinating to hear uh, your journey, uh, and uh, keep doing that. Uh, we need very many more people who look less like me and Stephen uh, and Alan, especially me and Stephen, uh, uh, and uh, look and sound like you to be spreading the word. So thank you for that. I have very fond memories of visiting both Arequipa and Lima in 2016 for the APEC meetings then when Peru last uh, hosted. And I'm delighted, delighted to have the opportunity uh, to return to Peru uh, for the same reason some eight years later. New Zealand shares a very strong bond with Latin America. The Pacific Ocean connects us, and we appreciate the role that the Pacific Rim and APEC partners, Peru, Chile, and Mexico play in our region. APEC provides a chance to highlight the region's significant trade collaboration, which has taken place bilaterally, regionally, and of course through the WTO. Uh, the government has set an ambitious target of doubling exports by value over 10 years. And to achieve this, we have committed to pursuing quality trade agreements, export diversification, dismantling trade barriers, and opening doors for New Zealand exporters through trade missions. To strength, uh, the strength of our economy is directly related to the success of our exporters. And we know that trade and investment is crucial for growth and to ease the cost of living to help New Zealanders to get ahead. New Zealand is open for business, and our business is your business. And we know that there are further opportunities to grow our trade and business opportunities in the Latin American region. We're pursuing further work to expand the CPTPP and aspire to become an associate member with the Pacific Alliance. Both paths will bring us closer to Peru and to Latin American region, economically, strategically, and importantly, people to people. We welcome the interest from Latin American economies in the CPTPP, and the agreement was always envisaged as a vehicle to connect the Americas, Asia, and the Pacific via trade and investment. Regarding the Pacific Alliance, I want to congratulate Peru on the successful presidency of the Alliance, which has recently passed to Chile. Latin American partners have shared our ambition and been alongside us to develop new ideas and norms to advance trade policy. Chile has been a key partner for us, as you heard earlier, in the P4, the CPTPP, our agreement on non-tariff barriers, and of course, the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement. And we're delighted to work with both Costa Rica and Peru to progress their membership of DEPA. Costa Rica is also one of our negotiating partners for the agreement on climate change, trade and sustainability, which I hope to conclude uh, in the coming weeks. Australia, 
Canada, Chile, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Mexico are our partners for the Inclusive Trade Action Group, ITAG. And these members, as well as Argentina, Argentina uh, Brazil, Colombia, and Peru, are our partners in the Global Trade and Gender Agreement. I'm also pleased and honoured to have been invited uh, as a guest by Brazil to attend the G20 Trade Ministers meeting in October. Our region's economic success and dynamism has long been underpinned by the strength of our interconnection, and the region is a testament to the transformation power of trade and economic integration. APEC is part of our trade policy bedrock. In fact, the very first visit by a New Zealand Prime Minister to Peru in the context of our hosting year of APEC in 1999 uh, Peru's first full year of APEC membership. APEC economies share a vision for a more prosperous and sustainable Asian Pacific region, one shared strongly by New Zealand. APEC 21 members are a destination for almost 80% of New Zealand's exports. It's a region that's home to 40% of the world's population and accounts for 60% of global GDP, and it's a region that contributed two-thirds of the global economic growth last year. More specifically, APEC does three important things. Incubate, innovate trade, innovative trade in economic ideas, engage our key partners in the region, and progress our trade initiatives like DEPA and the CPTPP and many others. APEC's work is very practical. It focuses on supporting businesses and facilitating trade. Examples of this include reducing and eliminating tariffs on a range of vaccines and related goods and services during New Zealand's host year in 2021, increased uh, use of digital processes and certification at the border to cut red tape, make it easier and cheaper for trade, benefiting our businesses but also our citizens and consumers, and the APEC business travel card now in digital form, enabling the flow of business people uh, more easily across the region. And the world's first and only agreed list of environmental goods uh, with uh, reductions, uh, reduced tariffs on these, and environmental services. Peru's APEC uh, host year uh, theme of empower, include and GROW sets the scene for more intensive collaboration through APEC, and right now APEC is more important than ever. The value of collaboration has never been greater. I recently attended the MC13 uh, WTO ministerial meeting and was uh, disappointed, you know, and the disappointing outcomes there are a stark warning to us all that without collaboration, international trade will suffer. New Zealand will be looking to work in the regional and multilateral fora like APEC to continue to robustly support the WTO and the multilateral trading system and to keep us moving forward to the benefit of all. So I can assure Peru, uh, our other fellow APEC economies and businesses and stakeholders, New Zealand is committed to supporting Peru's APEC hosting year in 2024. And I look forward to returning to Arequipa in May and Lima in November for Peru's APEC hosting year. Equally as important, I look forward to sampling, as I mentioned earlier, world famous Peruvian cuisine. Thank you so much, muchas gracias a todos. And just on a side note from that, it's a huge opportunity. Uh, we often talk about uh, New Zealand's place in the world. There's nowhere easier to get from Southeast Asia to South America or South America to Southeast Asia than via New Zealand and certainly uh, via Auckland. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us, certainly the new government, look for ways to increase that uh, and to find uh, ways to make that uh, journey uh, so much easier. I'm often asked about our ambitions in, um, in uh, South American reasons for them. It's great to see so many more young people from South America, America coming to New Zealand, uh, coming for work, for study, to do OEs and so on. And it's just an area of the world that we want to put in so much more effort, and along with Southeast Asia and elsewhere, to ensure that we're offering opportunity. 
My various visits previously as Trade Minister reminded me of just how much more we have in common. I remember a visit to uh, Chile uh, where uh, we visited um, dairy farms that looked like New Zealand, uh, except that the people sounded different. We were just as hardworking. And if you look geographically on the map, I think it lines up with part of the Waikato. We were able to share expertise from New Zealand to help create an industry that complements what we do and drives incomes and so on uh, for people in that country. And there's many other parts of the uh, Pacific Alliance where I think we can do the same. So again, uh, to uh, uh, my good friend, the Ambassador for Peru, we look forward to the visit. And then finally, I, I realise now that I've stopped reading from my notes and look around uh, many other ambassadors uh, from the EU. Uh, uh, we're so pleased to have not only concluded, but have entry into force. So very much sooner than others expected our agreement, which is not far away. Our former Trade Minister Tim Grosser, who actually knows more than Stephen, but the two of them together. <laughs> Great to see you there. And indeed, when uh, we had observer status of the Pacific Alliance, it was through Tim's work, and my former colleague and good friend uh, from Rotorua, uh, Fletcher Tabito, who has visited South America many times. I say my very good friend because he's my constituent. <laughs> and now that he's not standing for Parliament, there's election in two years' time. So good to see you, Fletcher. Thank you so much. Thank you, Minister, for touching on the key points, not just about APEC, but about New Zealand's relationship with Latin America. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that a delegation of University New Universities New Zealand will be leaving on Saturday um, to, to visit the region and to try and recruit more of those students here to enrich our society in so many ways. Now, I don't know if you have, we're slightly over time. Do you have time for questions or? or? Yeah, very long questions, very short answers, yes. <laughs> okay. Well, please, if anyone has a question, we have microphones in the room. A, a question, not a speech. And if you could keep <laughs> it short and name yourself, please. Thank you. Any takers? I yes. Say I mentioned the Petco Sour too early. Uh, thanks, uh, Minister. Thanks for being here tonight and uh, contributing to the evening. Um, my question is uh, firstly to acknowledge the ambitious target around the export growth, and I think that's fantastic. As the Minister for Trade and perhaps even the Agriculture Minister, have you given consideration to what we're seeing around the world in terms of obligations of our export markets around carbon neutral product and, and the delivery of a carbon neutral uh, product to market um, around the world, especially Europe seems to be the big one at the moment, but I think that's going to expand as um, these conversations carry on. Yeah, look, it's at the forefront of the government's mind. Uh, we have international obligations to uh, uh, you know, uh, reduce carbon and carbon emissions, and we're focused on how to do that. You'll have seen over the last few days the government taking action to talk about a review of the science so we can make sure in the area of agriculture we know what it is we're asking farmers to do and then work with them to be able to achieve that, and the um, Climate Change Commission also has started to do the same thing. I think I have a very, very clear message for uh, many New Zealanders, particularly agricultural <laughs> community. We must meet our obligations, but we also must talk about the work that's been done and that New Zealand and uh, food producers are some of the lowest carbon uh, emitters in the world when it comes to that food. So that's not an opportunity for us to say, well, we uh, therefore are better than others, we don't have to do anything. We must meet our obligations, and the government is committed to working with farmers and others across the sectors to do so. But the other important thing, I think, about the reputation New Zealand has, particularly, you know, when 80% of our exports come from the primary sector of the goods that we export, you know, of high quality, safe food and fibre, is that the part of that reputation also moves into the area of environment and climate change. And I have many of our exporters talk to me about, you know, the interests of their customers, not consumers, but the people they supply that have the relationship with the consumers in Europe and America and Asia and so on. It's a very important part of what we do. And as we look at our trade strategy and how we can work with, uh, you know, all New Zealanders to double exports by value over 10 years and lead trade missions, we make 
sure that actually, you know, that reputation uh, becomes part uh, of that. In fact, the PM is about to jump on a plane in the next few days and do the first trade mission or business visit uh, through Southeast Asia, and a minister of climate change is going with him, in part because there are many partnerships that we can grow and we can develop with like-minded countries and finding solutions to, you know, how we get uh, emissions down whilst allowing people to stay in business and how we become more efficient. I think that what is most useful for us to have the debate in New Zealand is in, you know, not only how we meet the, our, these international obligations, but it's about uh, as much about emissions efficiency as it is about reduction. How can we do more with the same amount or how can we be more productive by using less, and it's something that I know New Zealand Agriculture and many other businesses have done. I think we can have a real leadership role in that around new technologies and innovation and advancement that we get to work with close-minded partners and share with the world as we continue to focus on meeting that obligation of net zero by 2050. Thank you. Uh, maybe time for one more question. Well, that's only one because I'd said short answers on that sorry, short one. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Susie Kerr, Environmental Defence Fund. I wanted to follow up on, on what you were just saying about to ask what do you see as the potential for cooperation on climate change between New Zealand and Latin America, given the really strong similarities in the challenges that we face? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I think there's a couple of areas. The first is a lot of the, the, the innovation that's taking place on farm around food production as that goes forward is something that we can work together on in share. Uh, I think you are right. There are a lot of similarities. The other area that I think is really interesting is the role of uh, farm uh, production forests in sequestering carbon and how you get to use that, uh, you know, ongoing through a supply chain. There's sometimes a debate in New Zealand, it feels like we're having, as you need to do one or the other. Actually, the government's view is very simple. You know, we were going to meet our obligation and we should look for the most cost-effective, almost cheapest way to do so, so that we can grow our economy, you know, provide the, the quality of life and standard of living that New Zealanders demand and, and, and deserve. Uh, but at the same time ensure that there's not unnecessary disruption in cost. It's very easy to say it's a challenge to do, but we get to do that uh, with like-minded people and using innovation. I, uh, I'm looking forward to my visit to Peru and we're looking at other side visits because, you know, when I was last Trade Minister seven or eight years ago, we were going on the world stage and we would talk about trade. Uh, my very first uh, visit to the WTO ministerial meeting was in Kenya, where we had a first visit, uh, a first uh, um, discussion around, uh, I think from memory, fossil fuel subsidies, or it might have been around fisheries, one of the two. And it was a small panel of there, the US was beside me, the trade rep, a few others, and others came to listen. And that's grown over the six or seven years to be uh, becoming uh, what uh, is uh, many other countries in the WTO that have signed on to. You know, discussions around climate change and meeting obligations are, are much more prevalent now than they were seven or eight years ago. And, and I guess what I'm saying is there's a real opportunity opportunity for New Zealand to not only play its part, but in many areas, particularly in the area of innovation, uh, to show great leadership. We don't have to lead the world by shutting down businesses, but we absolutely should lead the world in working with others in like-minded countries and innovating and using science and technology to meet not only climate change, but environmental challenges where we can, you know, uh, uh, produce more uh, by being more efficient and use less. It's now my um, honour to invite the Ambassador of Peru um, to deliver the closing remarks for our event tonight. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister Todd McClay, uh, Professor Robin Longhurst, Matthew Omiger, um, distinguished panel, and dear friends. Uh, the first thing is uh, I would like to ask your kind indulgence. I know uh, you are very eager to go and enjoy of the cocktail party, especially because uh, tonight we're offering a, a very nice variety of Pisco cocktails. 
Um, as uh, Minister uh, McClay mentioned, we have an ongoing conversation with uh, Chile about this issue, but it's a very friendly conversation, let me tell you, Minister. Uh, Chile is one of the, our main uh, trade partners. Uh, it's a very important source of investment for Peru, as it's a very important uh, destination of investment for Peruvian companies, as you know. And uh, also is the most important, the first market for exports of Peru and Pisco in the world. <laughs> so, um, my good friend of the, uh, the, the Charrier Affairs of Chile, I hope you can enjoy our Pisco as we enjoy yours tonight. <laughs> Having said this, um, the first book that I have ever uh, read was uh, one that I found uh, I forgot in a cinema, in a movie theater, um, many, many years ago. I was about uh, maybe eight years old. And um, even, even um, that so much time has passed, uh, I, I still remember uh, that this was a very strong story and also a very pessimistic one, starting for the title. It was a novel a very famous Peruvian novel, eh, El Mundo es Ancho y Ajeno, by Peruvian novelist or writer eh, Ciro Alegría. Um, a literal translation of this would be something like the world is white and belongs to others. But in this context, the word ajeno eh, means not only something that belongs to others, but also something that is far away, out of our reach. Um, this was the view that uh, indigenous communities in Peru have of the reality of the Andes in the 1930s. A uh, time and a place that was not too friendly uh, for them. Um, the thing is that um, the first time I was posted in the Asia Pacific in the late uh, 19th, 1990s, I was surprised to observe the same pessimistic view of our region in, in several countries in regard to our region. Um, we had diplomatic re uh, relations, it's true, but we barely give them any purpose or content uh, beyond speeches. And I, I saw uh, Dr. Tim Grosser here, and I think it's you, Dr. Grosser, who said that our relations were just fueled but a kind of occasional and spasmodic um, enthusiasm um, during that time. Um, the situation, of course, has been gradually changing. The Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, the CPTPP, the Digital Economy Partnership, uh, initiatives all in which New Zealand has played, of course, a key role, have been providing tools uh, to slowly lift the veil of the lack of information, knowledge, understanding, and trust between our countries. But the thing is that change has not happened fast enough. The demands and expectations of our people are growing, as is their impatience. Our people need and want new and better opportunities, and we can only deliver them if we speed up changes that can produce healthy, vigorous, and sustained growth. One of the most important changes in today's Asia-Pacific scenario is building connectivity. We need to rapidly create and develop strong and stable connections between our economies. The past two years, I have had the opportunity to visit different regions in your beautiful country. And something I have repeatedly, repeatedly found is that business people still have 
many unanswered questions. Business people still have concerns about what is waiting for them on the other side of the Pacific. And consequently, they decide to stay with the markets they already know. To overcome this situation, it is urgent to create a strong connections between our economic agents, especially the medium and small ones, and business associations and chambers play a key role in this endeavor. We need to give our business people someone to lean on on the other side of the Pacific, as if they were at home. Overcoming this business trust gap, which can easily translate into an indifference gap, will make possible to take advantage of the massive, massive potential that our interconnected markets offer. And just as we find ways to effectively connect our chambers and business associations, we have to find ways to connect our academic and research centers, our ports, our airports, and our city councils to create a resilient and dynamic economic network in the Asia Pacific. Dear friends, we need to take initiatives like APEC, the CPTPP, the Digital Economy Partnership, and the Southern Link to the streets. We need to take them to the people. We need to take them beyond government offices, beyond multilateral meeting rooms, beyond academic conference rooms like this one. We need all these fantastic initiatives in which, I repeat, New Zealand had a very important participation, all these initiatives to become part of people's lives, to stop belonging just to elites. That is one of the central messages of APEC Peru 2024, APEC for the people. Any public policy must be born in the streets, must involve dialogue, and must produce real and concrete benefits in daily people life. Finally, I would like to mention the role of the press. The press is not only the guardian of our freedom of expression and opinion, the guarantee of our democratic systems, but it's also an essential channel of dialogue with the people. So we need to involve the press in this process. Once again, to take advantage of this huge business potential, we just need to build connections. If we manage to do it in a short time, I'm sure the Asia Pacific will stop being those distant and foreign places that seem out of our reach. Minister McClay, thank you very much for being here with us this afternoon. We know you are very busy. Thank you uh, for your vision and support for a New Zealand open to all regions in the world, for a New Zealand with the ambition and the drive to explore new markets and to conquer new markets. I am sure that with this view and this support, we will be able to build a strong and vigorous relation between New Zealand and Latin America. Professor, thank you very much for providing this wonderful uh, venue. And Matthew, dear Matthew, I'm sorry, I take longer that it was expected, but I want to thank you, really, to you and the Cape, Latin Cape, because uh, your institution is um, really necessary institutions for the develop development between Latin America and New Zealand. No institution in the private or private or public sector in New Zealand has done so much uh, for this goal. So for that, we're very grateful.
Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you allow me, uh, Minister, uh, we would like to present some small tokens of appreciation for you. And, uh,